Okay. Good evening. My name is Holly Morgan. I'm the executive director for the West Virginia Farmers Market Association. Tonight, we are hosting webinar two of our top series. This one is about soils. Um, the whole, whole uh, purpose of top is transitioning to an organic partnership program. So we are going to learn uh, some organic soils management tonight. About us, uh, we are the West Virginia Farmers Market Association. Our mission is to strengthen the capacity of West Virginia farmers markets and impact the communities that they serve by providing healthy uh, food, locally grown food, education, and advocacy. And we um, do that through many educational avenues. We have labeling classes that we do to prepare people to become farmers market vendors. Uh, we have market manager trainings available on our website as well. Uh, we are also... Um, working on some more projects and educational projects in the spring. And there's also hands-on um, aspects to some of our programming as well. So we hope that you will sign up for our newsletter on our website, www.wvfarmers.org. And you can get all that information as it comes out and you can see where we are going to be hosting classes next. So what is TOP? TOP is the Transition to Organic Partnership Program. It's a USDA initiative that invests $100 million over five years uh, for education, technical assistance, and support to producers transitioning into becoming organic producers. Um, there's farm-to-farm -farm mentoring, technical training and assistance, and then there's also uh, community building. And that is where the West Virginia Farmers Market Association fits into this uh, program. We are doing community building with virtual and in-person classes to help get people ready to take that leap into certification if that's what they wanna do. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and welcome uh, Isaac and his wife, Holly. Uh, she's not on tonight, but she probably may jump on later. They are of Next, or Next Seven Organic Farm. And I will let uh, Isaac take it away. All right. So uh, I guess tonight I'm going to uh, share a little bit about organic soil management and uh, to properly share, um, I guess, management strategies. Uh, a good place to start is to really dive into the soil and uh, look at the soil and really understand what's happening um with it on, on a on a scientific and uh uh chemi chemical basis um understanding soil chemistry so um let's uh start with the uh slides here so yeah the uh the first thing i'd like to kind of touch on with soil is you know what is it and you know what are we paying attention to as farmers and uh so soil is a, a really complex material it's it's um it's a broad term i i guess because there's so many different kinds of soils on the earth um but as farmers we're we're talking about uh production soils about horticultural soils that we're we're uh actively growing in and and managing so um the first thing you know to start with if you're looking at your soil if you're looking to understand what you're growing in better or if you're looking to plant a new uh a new crop field is the the soil structure you know and um from the top down you know we've got our, our living topsoil layer and that's where we're going to have the most organic matter broken down from crop residues um that's that's where all the the life is happening in the soil uh there's a lot of exchange happening at the surface level just below the surface of the soil and uh it's a really important layer um Below the topsoil, we've got the subsoil. The subsoil is going to be uh, less organic in in composition, and it's going to start taking on more of that um, 
base layer of uh, of mineral soil characteristics. And then below that is is whatever your base strata is, whether you're working in a place where there's there's sandstone or, or granite soils. Um, it just depends on what part of the world you're in, what what your uh, real deep uh, base rock kind of composition is. Uh, let's uh, move on with uh, the next slide here. Okay, so when when you're thinking about that soil structure, uh, there's a really easy and great test that that I suggest people get familiar with, um, and it's just a jar test. And you can you can dig up a sample of your garden soil, um, you know, try to try to get the top few inches of what plants are going to be growing in and uh, what you're going to be cultivating and, and working with you know you don't have to you don't have to dig down there uh, 18 inches deep and get subsoil out um, but in, in your growing layer in in your bed soil or in in the soil in your rows take a sample and and put it in a jar of water and and give it a good shake and then let it let it settle out you know let it sit overnight and when you look at it the next day, you'll see that it's settled out in layers and uh, the composition of the layers, you can see it, it's, it's rather generic uh, diagram here, but it gets the point across that, you know, you have your, your sands and gravels on the base and then you'll have your silts and then you'll have your finer clays that settle out on top. And if you have a lot of organic matter in your soils, you'll you'll even find you have a floating uh, humus layer that is uh, organic materials. And so it gives you a good idea of what percentages of, of uh, composition your soil is. And that can give you a, a place to start as far as how you're going to treat that, how you're going to amend it what's your plan for um, preparing it for production. Um, we can move on. Okay, so uh, dead dirt and healthy soil. This, this, is a, this is a good topic here, getting into organic soils and, and where the difference is in, in um, Traditional agriculture with uh, heavy mechanical tillage uh, and cultivation and also um, synthetic, you know, chemical fertilizer inputs, uh, herbicides, pesticides, etc. Um, healthy soil has a lot of life in it. It has a lot of microorganisms in it. Soil that's been overworked, soil that's been over fertilized um that microbiology can't handle um the the impact and uh oh what do i want to say the disturbance um heavily cultivated uh mechanical tillage uh is is a constant disturbance and that disturbance knocks back the the microbiology in the soil and so the reason that's so important is, you know, the microbiology in the soil is really the, the digestive system for the plants. Just like, um, just like us and animals, we have microbiology in our gut. Uh, you know, we're full of bacteria that help us digest our food. Those bacteria break nutrients down in a way that make them available to our cells. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to get the nutrients out of the food we're eating. Um, so plants are the same way, except, you know, they're, they're getting some energy from the sun, but they also need uh, mineral and bio nutrients from the soils. And those roots, roots can take up nutrients directly. Um, they can take up water directly, but that capacity greatly, greatly increases with the microbiology that's present in the soil. So beneficial bacteria, beneficial funguses, um, 
you'll you'll hear the term mycorrhizal fungus being thrown around a lot in the world of living organic soils. Um, all of this microbiology increases the extent of uh, terrain that these plants' roots can get out to. And, you know, these myceliums from the funguses, they grow so fast that they can really spread out and increase the amount of square footage that every plant is able to tap into to get its water and nutrients. And those funguses and bacteria, they, they help to break down mineral nutrients and they help to process uh, bionutrients and convert it into a uh, assimilatable form for, for the plants to... Uh, go directly from the cells of these fungus into the cells of the plant's root tips and into the rest of the plant where it needs these nutrients. So, you know, dirt and soil are different things. And uh, my dad, he was, he's a horticulturalist. He is a, a West Virginia university graduate. And, and he, he had a professor he would tell me about who would say, you know, dirt's what's under your fingernails and, you know, soil is, is what plants grow in. So it's, it's a big difference. And um, the idea of, of a living organic soil is, is really what I want to focus on here with this transition to organic um topic that we're we're focused on with these talks and you know why what's the reason to take on this extra work this uh certification processes and only using inputs that are are certified for organic production and uh, for me as a grower I, I really feel like it comes down to treating the soil as a, a living ecosystem it's not just a growing medium. I've worked in hydroponics. I've worked in container gardening. Um, soilless medium is a term you might hear. And that's just grown in container mixes where, where you have a, a peat base or a perlite base, uh, a coconut core base. Um, and there's no actual you know, native soil in those containers. It's, it's a soilless medium. And uh, most of it's usually inherently sterile until you add the microbiology to it. So when we're mixing up these, these sterile mediums for, for potting mixes and seeding mixes and starting plants in the greenhouse, getting things at uh, a jump, you know, it's it's important that we're thinking about where the microbiology in these sterile mixes is coming from. And we'll use earthworm castings, we'll use compost teas, we'll use fish emulsions to promote that, we'll inoculate with mycorrhizal funguses. Um, so there's there's uh, a direct need to put this, this living organic uh, microorganisms into these soil mixes so that the the digestive system is present there for the plants and, and they can get a they can get a square meal um let's move on to the next slide so you can see in the in the photos to the left you know the healthy is a picture under a microscope of you know uh some of the microorganisms that are swimming around on a slide underneath the microscope from a soil sample. The unhealthy uh, is a, you know, overworked soils where, you know, you, you've got a lot of uh, soil disturbance. Maybe there's been a lot of chemical input and the microbiology just isn't present in, in, in the soil enough to, um, nurture the plants with what they need so you see you know microorganisms serve as the digestive system and provide the needed nutrient exchange pathways between minerals and bionutrients so you know the plants can can feed themselves somewhat but the microorganisms are really where their digestive system is 
And it makes a, a very significant difference in the overall health and immune system of the plant. And, you know, the, the flower sites that get produced, the growth rates, and it affects the quality of the harvest in the end and even how long vegetables stay good for after they're harvested. So um, it's, it's maybe the most important thing to think about uh, when you're thinking about organic production is what are my microorganisms doing in the soil and uh, how can I make that better? So let's let's uh, move on. Here we go. Bionutrient mineralization strategies. So there's there's a lot of nutrients present in the soil that need processed by something else, or they need to be chemically bonded to another compound, another amendment per se, to uh, be absorbed by the plants in an efficient way. So when you have production soils and you know that you're trying to give these plants everything they possibly need to thrive, um, you know that you're going to want to add some mineral content. You know, you know that you're going to want to add uh, carbon content. You're going to want to build up the 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 biological material that's present in your soil um the more you build up that organic matter the more the microbiology can thrive and that in turn helps water retention water absorption nutrient retention nutrient absorption and uh, you'll see here I've got uh, great EC levels. So EC levels are the electrical conductivity um, that's happening either in the soil or actually in, in the plant material. And that is, that's something that you can actually measure. You can, you can track it. And it's directly affected by the, the biology present in the soil as well as the minerals in the soil. And um, everything's electrical. Uh, the, the nutrient exchange pathways between a mineral to a microorganism to a plant's roots into the plant's cell walls and fruits and flowers and such, it, it happens by way of positive and negative charges, you know, just like a battery. And, you know, uh, we're, we're an electrical creature as well. You know, we've got all kinds of electrical um, mechanisms firing in our nervous system and our brains and our bodies that keep everything going around. So if your, if your water carrying capacity isn't, um, isn't up to the level it, it should be, it, and in, in, in dry soils and drought conditions, um, you lose a lot of that electrical conductivity because water is conductive and um, kind of acts as the connector between these different organisms and, and different minerals and nutrients that are present. So increasing that water holding capacity with your organic matter and in turn with your microbiology especially the mycorrhizal funguses, um, that's going to help those EC levels so much. And uh, really a simple thing that, you know, I recommend anybody who's growing crops, especially vegetables, um, especially vegetables, definitely plan on, on your irrigation, you know, uh, here in Appalachia, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Ohio, we're blessed with good soils and a lot of water in the landscape and a lot of rain. And, you know, if we're going to have a drought or dry conditions, we kind of know what time of the year that's going to be. And it, and it typically doesn't last too long. So, you know, you can kind of, you can kind of get away with raising crops without having to irrigate necessarily. But when you when you add that irrigation aspect to it and you can keep a high 
capacity of water intake um, coming to your soils and your crops, it drastically increases your yields and drastically increases the health of your plants just due to the fact that that EC level, that electrical conductivity can be increased because the water's present. So the nutrients can move and, you know, the plants can take up what they need and the soil can breathe and everything works a little bit better. So basic things like irrigation, um, we, we use, we use drip lines with most of our production. Um, and, and it's simple, it's efficient, it's really easy to work with and it's, it's low cost for the, the yield return that you can expect from setting up a system like that. So, um, the uh, EC level is is something to keep in mind with the uh, organic management of your crop soils. All right, let's uh, move on to uh, the other slide. All right, so this is a great uh, slide here, and and the last slide kind of sets this up nicely. So. With the, with the nutrient exchange pathways that are happening in your living soil, um, you have to get the right elements available to your plants. And, you know, traditional ag um, fertilizers, they have an NPK rating that's listed on whatever product it is, you know, it's your nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium levels. And, you know, some of them, uh, it depends on the product, but, you know, maybe it's a 10, 10, 10, or, you know, there's, there's different kind of generic, um, farm fertilizers. Uh, most of them are, are chemically, uh, created their mined materials, um, and, uh, they work and, and that's why the, they're used in, in, on a broad scale in conventional agriculture, but they, they fail in a sense because of their effect on the, the microbiology in the soil. A lot of times they're overused, um, trying to push that yield higher, uh, you know, more nitrogen, more phosphorus and potassium isn't always what's missing or, or what's causing the lack in the yield. And uh, the chemical fertilizers can can have a detrimental effect on the the microorganisms. And then if you follow that with with heavy mechanical cultivation and tillage, you're setting yourself up for a handful of problems. And when you're transitioning from traditional agriculture to certified organic agriculture, it really kind of changes the way you have to think about your soil. And I, I like to relate that, you know, a, a human being can be kept alive with an IV drip in a hospital bed, but it's, a world of difference than than having a square meal that that you actually ate and digested through your own gut and your own flora in your body and chemical fertilizers are are basically an iv feed for the plants it's it's directly available to them um but it's not a balanced meal so the the 16 essential elements required for plant life is um it's a good place to start and in in truth it's probably a lot more than that for absolutely thriving um biology um 32 or 34 or something might be more like it but the the main ones that really make a difference in in your organic growing are these ones here on this chart and, you know, your basic nutrients, your carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, a lot of that, most of that is coming from the environment 
somewhere. It's in the air, it's in the rain, it's already present in the environment. You're going to be bringing in some more carbon um, from biological materials breaking down. If you're adding composts, um, you're going to be increasing your carbon content in, in those ways. Um, now, you can lose carbon content as well, too much tillage, um, over harvesting, over harvesting the biomass off of a patch of soil with no returns. Um, you can lower those carbon levels to where it becomes almost dysfunctional levels. Um, nitrogen, nitrogen is, is what's really being used in, in vegetative growth. It's put in the green on plants it's putting the the leafy vegetation the herbaceous growth out there um phosphorus is is root development um it goes into flower development and structure as well and then potassium is really a um potassium's root development as well but it is a flowering and fruiting nutrient so you really want to have good high potassium levels for crops that you're trying to push a lot of flower production on, like say cherry tomatoes, say peppers, things like that. You want that high K, especially when you're, you're feeding them in the end when, when they're fruiting heavy, because they will actively deplete that with fruiting. And, you know, if you think about plants and you compare them to humans, you know, when you're when you're starting seeds and you have tender little transplants, you know, we treat them like little babies. And, you know, once they get up growing, you know, like teenagers, you know, they can eat a lot. They're growing fast. Um, you know, they're just they're thriving. They're they're not mature yet, but they're growing fast, you know. So that's that's kind of that intermediary phase between a mature crop and a in a, a growing crop and then you know these fruiting plants uh essentially they're they're pregnant ladies and they're forming fruit and just like uh, a pregnant woman needs all the nutrients and vitamins to grow a healthy baby crops need that care as well when they're heavily fruiting crops and you're trying to have high yields um so that's that's just a little uh you know metaphor on on how to think about these nutrients and, and when to use them and, and why um the secondary macronutrients listed here the calcium magnesium and sulfur are are very important in balancing the the chemical processes behind the uptake of your NPK. Um, so a lot of times it'll appear like you have a, let's say a nitrogen deficiency or maybe it looks like a phosphorus deficiency when really you might have a calcium or magnesium deficiency. And there's even a chance that you could use a little sulfur and then the micronutrients as well play into um, different soil types, different nutrient absorption. Um, let's see, boron, for example, is a great one. Um, if it's not present in a high enough concentration in your soils, you're going to have deficiencies in your, your nutrient exchange you're going to be losing some of what could be available just because that boron isn't present for a couple um, chemical reactions that's happening at the, the cell wall level in, in plant cells. Um, so mineralization, you know, the, the elements on this chart are all coming from, from mineralization and there's different mined mineral products that are OMRI listed. And that's something I'll get into here in a little bit is OMRI listed products with the organic certifications. Um, but a lot of these minerals, uh, they're bagged, mined, powdered minerals. Uh, some you can find that are water soluble. You can use in your, your drip lines and your irrigation to get it to where it needs to go. 
Um, and then another way to think about this too is a lot of plants are uh, bioaccumulators and, and they're, they're bringing up specific nutrients from that subsoil and, and processing them in a way that they become more available to other plants. So when that plant grows up and it dies and that plant material decomposes, it's releasing some of these elements back into the soil, essentially. So if you know what you're missing and you know a plant that can help mine it from the soil for you or help uh, sequester it from the atmosphere, um, you know, nitrogen fixers, uh, the legumes, beans, um, vetch, there's a lot of good nitrogen fixers. Um, some are a crop, you know, you can raise beans, you can pick a crop, they're fixing nitrogen, or you can raise a crop, say like a, like a vetch, um, and, and till it back in. And when you're, when you're tilling them back in and, and that plant materials breaking down, um, it's, it's releasing nitrogen from, from the plant material, from the roots in the soil, that it's collected from the atmosphere and it's putting it into a form that other plants can get. So um, bioaccumulators using plants to uh, concentrate elements and um, bringing in amendments. Um, there's a lot of different products out there, um, mineral wise that are great products um, and it's worth the investment. It's an, it's another one where, you might be buying a 50 pound bag of a mineral mix and it might be pretty expensive. You know, you might be paying 30, 50, $70 for a 50 pound bag or something, but the chances are when you apply it at the right rates to your, to your growing area, the, the yield you're going to get back out of having those minerals present makes the investment in that amendment very very worth it you know you're you're not going to be losing money you're going to be gaining ground gaining yields all right let's uh move on to uh, another slide here we go so the the macro and microorganisms in the soil are super important they're the things that are moving uh they're actively decomposing uh crop residues plant residues um they're burrowing, they're, they're aerating the soil, you know, everybody knows earthworms, they get down there, they, they make earthworm castings, they aerate the soil, they're creating this vertical interface between the subsoil and the living topsoil, and that helps plants roots, um, not only with minerals and aeration, um, but just the structuring of the soil. So there's a lot of different little bugs and creepy crawlies on the chart over on this side. And it's a, it's a fairly good representation of if you have a healthy living organic soil, you, sh you should be finding a lot of these um, species and in, in families and kingdoms present. And something I like to kind of fill people in on thinking about all these microorganisms is if you can change nutrients and, and transfer that through these different kingdoms of life, you know, you've got the animal kingdom, you've got the fungus, you've got the bacteria, you know, um, and then it's going into, into the plant uh, kingdom. So, you know, if you can, exchange these nutrients and cycle them through these different kingdoms in the classification system of life, um, the more stable and healthy your whole system is going to be. So it's, it's the biodiversity in that living soil ecosystem that really is what's uh, increasing the, the carrying capacity and the health of the soil. So definitely learn about your bugs and, you know, you can go so far as to even introducing 
uh, bugs. Uh, there's some great companies out there that deal in beneficial bugs, um, worm farms, uh, et cetera, you know, bringing these species into your production, um, especially in more controlled environments like greenhouses and tunnels and such, you know, uh, a little investment and a little introduction um, of some beneficial species. And you're going to get uh, a lot of results from doing those efforts. All right, let's uh, go on to the next one here. All right, humates. Humates is another one I'd like to touch on as far as thinking about managing organic soils and agriculture. Um, humates are, are more or less condensed compost. So imagine you know, very, very aged, very, very condensed uh, carbon content compost. It's it's basically a powdered carbon of a biological nature. And um, there's various companies, there's various ways to get humates. Um, they're produced naturally in the gardens and in compost piles, but you can buy it as a bagged input. And the, the high carbon content and the structure of the humates and humic acids creates chemical bonds in the soil, um, positively and negatively charged ions uh, bond to these humates and make the nutrients more available and change the electrical charge of your soils. So you can see on the diagram on the left, um, it's it's a little hard to make out the details, but you can see there's a lot of this uh, free floating P on the uh, diagram on the left, and and it's it's uh, it's not getting used by the crop. It's just kind of floating around. But if you look on the side with the humates, you can see that there's these other bonds happening there. And so that action in turn helps um, these phosphates to be uh, absorbed by the plants. And, and it's basically a more favorable chemical bond happens and uh, it'll it'll release some ions and um plants can then actually take up that nutrient exchange. Um, if, if the electrical charge is um, the opposite, you know, if, if the, you know, the negative charge is attracting uh, molecules to bind to it, to get connected to those plant tissues and, and be processed, if they're putting off, if your soil's putting off a, a positive charge in the wrong place, the plant has a hard time forming those chemical bonds where they can absorb that nutrient. And, and a lot of that also comes down to the electrical conductivity. So humates being condensed carbon, more or less, um, carbon increases water retention and nutrient retention and that in turn increases the electrical conductivity and uh, forms these positive negative bonds in the soil that uh, make nutrients more available to plant material all right let's uh, move on to the next slide all right, there's there's something uh, a lot of farmers are pretty familiar with. There's a, a two bottom plow. Uh, it, it looks like it's a bigger, there might be three or four or five or six bottoms on that plow. Um, but you can see the action of, of what a plow is doing to the soil. And when we think about transitioning to organic and favoring living organic soils, um, we want to be careful with our, our mechanical disturbances, but at the same time, I've seen a lot of people maybe get steered in a, in a false direction with no-till 
no-till agriculture we hear the term no-till is kind of trendy um in the farming world and it, it is a great practice and that's what we're working towards with these living organic soils but you can't just start no-till management with zero mechanical input unless your mechanical input is semi-trucks bringing in topsoil and in a living growing medium for you to grow in so if you're if you're left to your native soils and that's what you're going to be uh producing in you're going to have to disturb it mechanically to to prep the soil to even make it possible to plant um to eliminate the weed pressure to eliminate the sod so mechanical management is a huge aspect of what we're actually doing out there on the farm, but understanding why we're doing it and knowing when to do it is, is valuable. Okay. Let's uh, go on to the next slide. Okay. So mechanical preparations for organic crop production and permanent beds. This is another hot topic with vegetable growers. Um, you know, are we out there row cropping? Are we flipping the entire garden surface? Are we driving tractors on that entire garden surface? Are we walking on it? Um, we got to keep compaction in mind when we're talking about production soils. Um, if, if, if soils are compacted, they can't absorb water properly. They can't absorb air properly. Plants' roots are are getting rooted shallow. They're they're fighting, you know. So, it it's hard to work. It's hard to plant. You know, when anybody thinks about good production soil, you know, you've got that soft, rich, moist, you know, chocolate cake that you can stick your hand into without hurting your fingers. And uh, so we want to reduce compaction as much as possible, but there's times where it's going to make sense to, to drive a heavy piece of equipment like a tractor. Um, and I, I really do recommend uh, vegetable farmers thinking about setting up permanent beds for production and really laying them out well, preparing them well and then sticking to it and this can drastically affect the amount of mechanical prep that you have to do to your beds between plantings between rotations of crops so it's going to save you a tremendous amount of effort to set up a permanent bed system um, a lot of people like a, a 30 inch bed with an 18 inch walkway that seems like a, uh, a standard measurement in a lot of production these days for organic vegetable growers. Um, it might not be the best thing depending on your crop, depending on your circumstance, sometimes row cropping and, and using a cultivator or some tillage and some mulching might be a better way to go. Um, but I, I like permanent beds. I like permanent walkways. It, it's a productive system and it, it's favoring that living organic soil. So whenever I'm starting a, a new patch of ground, um, if it hasn't been in production yet, I've converted a few pasture fields into production growing areas. Um, if you have a diverse farm, if you're raising livestock, livestock's a, of a great value to prepping soils, um, having that, heavy animal disturbance on soil um, can really set you up nicely for cropping. Um, so I'll, I'll prep a field months in advance and I'll, I'll, I'll use cattle, I'll use hogs, I'll feed them round bales and, and let them break down a lot of manure and, and rotted hay on the site. And sometimes I'll, I'll incorporate all of that in. Sometimes I'll scrape it to the side and compost it. 
but then I'll go in with a tractor and a chisel plow and the chisel plow is basically uh, about an 18 inch long uh, bar with a little cutting chisel foot plow deep down on the bottom and that's just cutting a trench and it's uh, just a narrow trench it's not flipping the soil it's just opening the soil and that increases your your water retention and absorption as well as your aeration and also helps with um, soil structure with um, reducing and um, alleviating any compaction and, and letting the plants roots penetrate um, deep into that subsoil. So chisel plowing is, is my first step when I'm prepping a garden. Then I'll start to work that topsoil layer a little bit more. Um, a lot of times you'll have sod, you'll have uh, pasture species, you'll have weeds, annual weeds, you know, sometimes you'll even have some woody, woody, rooty, um, shrubby material that's, that's starting to grow on a place. And if you're putting it uh, a patch of soil into production, you you really want to eliminate as much of that as you can. You know, you don't want to be fighting a lot of uh, breaking down roots and, and just odd uh, plant material and grass clumps and stuff. So to get rid of that stuff, you know, you can plow multiple times over the course of a few weeks, flip it once, give it some time, flip it again. It helps break down that herbaceous material. Um, after you, you flip it with a plow, a disc or a rake smooths it out on a nice level, helps to get some more of that debris out. And then you come in and you can till. And by tilling, you're, you're chopping that final bit of residue up into a small form that can decompose. And you're building a fine, finely structured seed bed. And that's, for me, the main point of tillage is to create that, that fine planting bed. And I really try to avoid deep tillage. Um, mechanical tillage is ultimately pulverizing your soil structure down into smaller, smaller bits. And it can be very damaging to your soil if you do it in the wrong kind of weather, if you do it when it's too dry, it turns it into dust. If you do it when it's too wet and your so soil's heavy, clay soils, um, you can set yourself up for just a, a lot of nasty clumps of hard material and, and stuff you don't want to be on your hands and knees planting in. Um, so tilling is really for that final smooth um, bed prep. And then even after the tillage, I'll go in with a rake and, and by hand prep beds with a rake before seeding and transplanting. Um, but as soon as you get into that three or four inches deep into the soil, you're back into a heavier aggregate with, with larger clumps and larger air spaces in between um, your soil particles. So the roots can get down there and they can run and get air and get water in abundance. Um, so minimize tillage. Um, if you overdo it, if you overdo plowing and mechanical tillage, you'll get what they call a hard pan. And basically your, your topsoil and your subsoil layer will get compacted together. And, you know, unless you really get down there deep and break it up, um, it's a huge barrier for water and air and plant roots and you're, you're, you're going to be losing production. And the, the last point I have on this slide is always keep production soils covered or planted. So exposed soil is distressed soil. Um, if you look at how nature works in a natural ecosystem, it's, it's always working to cover soil. Anytime soil gets disturbed in nature, something's going to grow because of that. There's, there's seed stock in the soil and that disturbance is going to give something a niche and it's going to grow and it's going to cover that soil again. 
And in production agriculture, uh, especially with annual crops and short cycle crops, you know, we're, we're flipping that soil so often and we're relying on that mechanical tillage so often. And if we're trying to keep a, a bare soil policy, you know, a garden that's very cleaned up, old fashioned, hoed up rows and, and bare soil, it looks really pretty and it can be very productive, but it's an intense amount of labor and it's setting you up for problems down the road. Um, so a healthy soil is a covered soil. And there's different ways to keep soils covered. So let's, uh, I think there's more on that in some of the next slides. Yeah, so here we go. Mechanical cultivation, hoeing, weed pulling, cultivators and tillage set weed competition um, back, but it tends to promote weed growth by disturbing the seed bed that's already present in the soil. So even though we're knocking it back and our crop is getting a chance to compete, we're just saying, bring it on again. I want more weeds every time we're, we're disturbing that soil um, until we wear out the seed bed, which sometimes could take a lifetime. Um, wearing out the weed seeds in your seed bed, um, perhaps the most effective means I've found um, and that I, I highly recommend to any vegetable farmers, organic or not, um, start adopting this management practice, but sheep mulching. Um, some people call it tarping. Um, folks are using large black and white silage tarps. They don't have to be black and white, but um, there's different ways to use that black and white to your advantage. And basically you're, you're preparing your soil like you would for, for planting seeds or transplants, but then you're giving it some time to be covered with this tarp. And basically this tarp is, um, it's promoting germination of all the weeds. It's providing a moist, warm, uh, area underneath of this tarp on your whole garden and all those little weed seeds that that want to jump off from your freshly tilled work that you put in prepping your beds you know they're going to grow and they're going to sprout but because there's that heavy opaque tarp on them they're not going to get light so what that does is basically it sprouts all the weeds and then they die and it depends on on the time of year and and your soils and your weeds but you know uh, a week to two weeks three or four weeks you can essentially knock back a lot of the weed growth that you would be competing with beforehand by tarping and any crop that isn't a short rotation crop that that's coming out of the ground in 30 days or basically kind of any, any crop that might take longer than 60 days out in the garden where it's going to live. I would suggest a, um, either planting those through ground cloth or adopting a, a deep mulching system of some sort, you know, deep mulch, the tomatoes, you know, deep mulch, the peppers, stuff that's going to be out there for 120 days you don't want to have to go out and fight weeds for 120 days so if you've got a crop that's going to be in for longer than say 60 days you know just plan on mulching it when you plant it and you're going to save yourself a lot of cultivation hours a lot of man hours and you're going to get a lot better results um, because the soil's covered it's able to hold that moisture a lot more biological action can happen under that layer of deep mulch. Um, so your crops are going to do better. And then uh, the final point on this slide is cover cropping uh, green manures and living mulches. So if, if you're familiar with the, the term green manure, it's essentially you're, you're growing a crop that you're going to just turn back into the soil 
um, and that herbaceous material is going to die, decompose. It's going to add to your organic matter and it's going to release some nutrients. Um, cover cropping for weed suppression uh, is a great strategy because it occupies the niche that the weeds are trying to occupy. Um, but by planning it and by doing it intentionally, you can get the jump on the weeds and you can keep them suppressed by growing a cover crop um, on, on your, on your field. Um, some crops can handle a cover crop being grown directly in a cover crop. Um, other crops, um, you know, they're they're a little more finicky about having other plants right up next to them so you know might not be the thing you want to do with your lettuce beds but you know it wouldn't be a bad idea to have clover under seeded in your in your tomatoes or your your sweet peppers you know you're you're not going to be hurting the crop you're going to be um, increasing the biological function and you're going to be keeping that soil covered and healthy and, and fighting weeds less. All right, let's see. What's uh, the next slide? Okay, so organic certifications and OMRI approved soil inputs. So the, you know, the, the topic of transitioning to organic and what that really looks like and what that means Um so we work with different organizations that are basically our certifiers. Um, they're providing a level of accounting um, and requiring us to, to record keep and requiring us to stick to approved uh, soil inputs and approved inputs otherwise into our production. So any of these organizations will be able to provide you with a book that is the current OMRI approved product book. And you can look through that and find hundreds of different companies making hundreds of different good products. And I'm, I'm not going to try to push any, any specific product. Um, I use a few that are that are convenient for us to use because of our our geography and what businesses are close to us um but there's a lot of there's a lot of great omri listed products available um becoming familiar with them and and why and when to use them in your production can really help um get those high yields and have healthy crops so just going down the list kind of quick here, I know that I'm five minutes over here and, and I'll try to wrap it up. Um, seaweed and kelp meals are great. They're, they're supplying a lot of those trace elements on, on the former charts. Um, the ocean has all of those elements in it and seaweed is a great way that it's concentrated. It's, it can easily be absorbed by plants and seaweed and kelp have their own nutrient bionutrients um, and, and plant phytochemicals and hormones as well that are coming from those seaweeds and kelps that can directly improve the yields of uh, garden crops. Um, compost, compost is a essential input in an organic production situation, um, hot composting as opposed to cold composting is, is preferable. It's, it's a higher quality um, product in the end and uh, safer for possible cross-contaminations with bacteria and food. And, um, and you're getting a lot of active biology in, in a hot composting situation. Um, animal, animal manures, uh, have been used for thousands of years and have a very appropriate place in organic agriculture. Um, we just want to be careful that we're not, um, 
disregarding any kind of cross contamination. You don't want to put fresh or freshly composted even manure on a situation where you're going to be growing, say, you know, your your lettuce beds and in crops that you're you're going to actively be eating things that are in in direct contact with that soil. Um, and most organic certifiers will require a certain amount of time to pass after the application of manures before you're planting an edible food crop. Um, I'd imagine different organizations may have different set amounts of time. Um, I think ours might be 90 days, um, but that gives things time to break down and process and avoid contamination. Um, potting soils, we're, we're starting with OMRI listed inputs. Um, we'll buy pre-mixed potting soils for our production of seedlings. Um, I also mix my own potting soils just by using OMRI listed inputs of, uh, you know, peat and perlite and, and some worm castings and some fertilizers. Um, and I'll mix up my own soils. Um, it's not for everybody. I, I, if you find a good bag mix, um, and you like it and, and, you, and you're not crazy about mixing soil, you know, stick with a good bag mix that somebody's putting out and it's typically going to be amended enough to uh, get you a good start without really needing to worry about how you're feeding your seedlings and transplants. Otherwise um, the bio biological inputs, the, the microorganisms, the, the mycorrhizal fungi, um, all of those are available on relisted. Uh, there's different products. There's seed inoculants. There's garden inoculants, uh, foliar sprays, uh, different different ways to use it. Um, mineral inputs, uh, calcium carbonate, green sands, carbonatite, lime, rock phosphates. There's several others. Um, that are all good mineral inputs. You can find them OMRI listed. Um, and then the liquid solubles, this is, you know, something that you're going to be mixing a nutrient solution. Maybe you're going to fertigate through your, your drip lines. Maybe you're just going to, uh, you know, apply it by hand, but the liquid solubles that, that we use and, and trust a lot are, are usually a, a fish emulsion or a fish and seaweed combination. Um, and there's a lot of good biologicals in there and you're getting a lot of the elements, those trace elements as well, because most of those uh, ingredients are coming from salt water. They're coming from the ocean somewhere. Okay, so let's see. I talked about the tarp, so the tarping and... Um, I can't stress it enough that uh, using the tarps, the, the actual term is a cultation. It's, it's basically darkening out the soil. Um, but using the silage tarps in your production is really going to put you ahead and it's going to help your soil stay healthy. All right, let's see. We can kind of we can kind of go through. And I think this, yeah, this is towards the end here. So I'll touch on crop rotation and then we can kind of wrap it up here. So um as vegetable gardeners, it's good to learn about every crop and the specifics behind raising it, um, its nutrient requirements, whether it's a heavy feeder or a low feeder or whether you're growing it for the leaf, for the fruit, or the flower, or the seed, um, and, and what it's related to, knowing uh, what crops are closely related. Um, we hear about crop rotation, thinking like this, and um, basically crop rotation just is setting you up for a healthier environment, and a more manageable uh, strategy of managing your nutrients and your in your soils. Um, when you're putting all the work into preparing a, a bed, a fresh planting area, um, if you're going to be putting down those amendments fresh for the first time, 
um, you know, I, I suggest starting with something that's a heavy feeder, you know, something that really needs those nutrients, your, your fruiting crops, your tomatoes, um, sweet corn, uh, things like that. You put a crop in like that, let it do its thing. It's going to eat up a lot of the nutrients that you just laid down, but there's going to be enough left over to raise a crop, say a root crop or a crop of greens and, and not need to reamend. Um, and then after that low feeder, maybe you give it a rest. Maybe you plant a green manure, maybe you amend again and then plant another heavy feeder. Um, but keeping a rotation between nutrient demands keeping a rotation between plant families so that you don't deplete specific nutrients and you don't favor um, pest problems. You know, if you're growing, um, say you're growing your sweet corn in the same sweet corn field every year, well, those corn borers are going to become localized. Um and you might get a good first year, you might get a good second year, but I guarantee by your third or fourth year, you're going to have some serious pest problems. And that's just coming from growing the same plant. It's the same food source for the same, you know, pest species. So your your yield is going to be affected eventually. So definitely plan a multi-year rotation for your production soils and, uh, try to stick to it and it, it'll set you up for, for a good workload and a good management of, of uh, your strategy out there and what you're cropping. Um, so there's, there's so much more I could say about soil management in regards to organic certification and transitioning to organic. Um, I'm already 15 minutes over my time here. So I'm going to wrap that up. And uh, if anybody, um, has any specific questions feel free to send them my way well thank you so much isaac we do have a poll that we are going to launch here this is our get connected with us okay. page. um because we we had some people jump on there um great so uh denise can you go ahead and launch the the first poll the are you an organic farmer one please <clears throat> The first one is knowledge assessment. Can you see it? Uh, just just go ahead and do the, or, are you an organic farmer one? <clears throat> okay. Are you certified? Okay. Yep. Okay. Can everybody see that? Yeah, I, I, I got it there. Okay. okay, perfect. Yeah, if you could just answer that questionnaire, I believe there's two or three of them on that thing. It didn't pop up on mine because I'm screen sharing, but... I think keeping this information about how to get in contact with the Western Farmers Market Association and Next 7 Organic Farm uh, is pretty valuable to keep on the screen here. So if you could answer those questions, um, just to say, you know, are you an organic uh, farmer? Are you interested in being certified? Um, and we can go on from there. Denise, have you gotten responses come through yet? Um no, I, I had just one question pop up and I hit submit and then it disappeared again. Okay. All right. Well, there we go. All <laughs> right, guys. That's all we needed to do for tonight. Uh, tomorrow, not tomorrow. Let's, let's do it next week. How about okay. that? Yeah, next yeah. Tuesday, we will do integrated pest management. You can register for this class online at www.wvfarmers.org. We will email you the Zoom link and the link for the YouTube uh, recording that is made from this video, uh, this webinar tonight. Uh, you'll get both of those in your email if you register. So go ahead and get on there and register. Again, thank you to Isaac and Holly. Uh, and thank you to everybody that came on here tonight. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. All righty. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.